All right. So, um, hey, everybody. My name is Aaron McDaniel. On behalf of uh, myself, Klaus Vihe, my uh, my co-author, co-founder of, of Global Class and our entire team, we welcome you today. We're super excited to uh, to have another growth story where we're here from another awesome uh, executive who has a ton of experience uh, as an entrepreneur, uh, expanding businesses to, to new markets. So um, definitely excited about that. We'll, we'll hear a little bit from, from our guest, Ezekiel, and then, uh, and then after that, we'll open things up for, for Q&A. So uh, feel free to, uh, to have your questions ready. We'll have that chance for that conversation, either in audio or uh, through typing, whatever you feel most comfortable with. But um, might as well uh, jump right in. So super excited to have uh, Ezekiel Rubin with us. So uh, Ezekiel is a uh, country manager for Olist, which is a Brazilian uh, online enablement platform for SMBs in uh, almost 200 countries. I think over 180, right? Which is pretty amazing. Um, and so uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of international focus when you're in that many countries. Uh, previously, Ezekiel was... Um, was a country manager for Despagar, the Argentinian online travel portal, and uh, had a number of other roles. He was also working in innovation at Unilever. And so uh, without further ado, we're, we're here to hear a bit about uh, how to be successful uh, in expanding your companies, and in particular, uh, as it relates to Ezekiel with his experience in, um, in Colombia and Mexico. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so you can share yours, Ezekiel, but uh, welcome to you. Great. Thank you, Aaron, for the introduction. Hi, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. Great to share my story. Uh, I think uh, Aaron Close, you're, I already said this to you, but I, I think it, it doesn't come as often. It's very nice, very important what you guys are doing, what you guys, guys are building. Uh, me, myself, being someone that went abroad uh, four years ago from my home country, from Argentina, with my, with, in that case, with Despegar, uh, having this type of solution, this type of books, this type of uh, information once we started would, would have been great. So uh, congratulations on that. And, and it's great to have this type of sessions and this type of, of moments to share experience because for myself, uh, sharing experience would be a much easier way for others to go through this path if, if they're in that path and for for the world to be more connected, you know, and, and companies being more aware, more connected on, on what to do. So I'm, I'm trying to focus my, I'm gonna try to focus my, my talk and my, my 15 minutes presentation on what is expanding internationally, what's your changing your company's north, not only by being the first country opening like we're doing today with all this, all this is abroad, but it's, it doesn't have an operation on all of those countries. Mexico is the first operation that we're moving from headquarters in Brazil, but also not the first move uh, for a company like the one I'm doing with all this. Also having the company already been in different countries and not finding or not getting the exact momentum, you know, the exact PMF for those companies that the one that my experience I had in Despegar in Colombia in Mexico. So uh, expanding is never easy. I find expanding uh, to any country uh, a, a very difficult task. Uh, there's not only moments where you should do it, where you can do it. You're, you're never too sure if that's the correct time, this correct moment. But also there's a lot of variables that you may think or, or, or the company may think as uh, something that are already fixed, already defined. That once you go abroad, once you go international, you have no clue how they actually mean, how they actually uh, need to be solved. And until you're there, sitting there in the same office or in a new office in a new country, you would never see it uh, in front of your eyes. You know, it's, it's not easy to go abroad from headquarters. It's not easy to define a new culture, a company culture, a company uh, workflow from headquarters. So um, even for companies that have already been abroad, abroad for a long time, finding that PMF and achieving that potential per market share, it's always a difficult, difficult task. And, and, and this phrase of this, this thing that I, I wrote there, it, it's actually very true. You know, that Despegar uh, was born in 1999 and went abroad in 2000. And I was a uh, country manager in Colombia in 2018. So there were 18 years between the first day Despegar went to Colombia 
and the, the day I, I arrived there, of course, there was there were other country managers, other, other people in the in the company. But what I found out was once I arrived to Colombia, there were many small things, many base things that for 18 years we hadn't had a, a way to solve it. You know, and, and I, my my first question was why? Why we we had 18 years the company in Colombia or in Mexico and still how to find a solution to very basic stuff, you know? And that, that was part of the challenge that I found in, in this regard in Colombia. And then I found it in, in, in Mexico, even with a company that already went ab abroad like, for like 15 or, or 18 years. So, so my point here is going abroad is not a simple uh, task. It's not a simple step you, you decide. It's a whole complex process, complex process and you need to understand from different angles, from different perspectives. I tried to define eight different perspectives that for me were very difficult and very surprised to find out once I, I moved from my home country, Argentina to, to Colombia the first time and then to Mexico. But of course, there are much many more uh, besides these eight that I defined here. And I'm gonna try to, to uh, make, make an example of each one of them because I, I think the, the best part here uh, it's to to put an actual fact on why I think trust, language, cultural fit, everyday living facts, channels, team motivation, blind spots, and quick wins versus big, big wins are actually some some of the things that you need to be seeing once you define or decide to go abroad. So starting with with the first four is trust, and I think Aaron and, and Klaus, you have already been talking and, and in the previous episodes probably they already been talking about this. For me, trust was mainly the, the main concept and the main variable to be aware of and also to be uh, uh, transmitting, you know, something that you need to transmit trust from wherever you are. So um, in my experience in this regard, I, before I went abroad to Colombia, I worked six years in the, in the company in headquarters. So I worked in a different, different positions, different areas, different senioritys also. So I, I, I was what, what Aaron and Klaus call an entrepreneur. I was an entrepreneur inside the company. I, I started very young and I uh, built myself up from different positions. I was uh, very well aware of all the people working in regard in different areas, not only on the local part, on the regional part. I, I had the opportunity to travel to different countries and see different ways of working of other countries while working in headquarters. So for me, knowing people, and knowing how to get to that, that people was something very, very important. And, and having those informal channels of communications was something that gave me a, gave me a, a different tool or a, a, a differentiation tool be, besides my, uh, my, my other country managers or the other country managers that were before me in Colombia, which gave me the opportunity to expedite some processes. You know? so, so the trust from headquarters um, gives you the opportunity to have things done much more quickly than the ones that come from a person that do not know or doesn't know the headquarters ways or the headquarters solution. So that trust was very important for the first month that I was in Colombia and in Mexico because it gave me the opportunity to start right away, not knowing or not starting, not, not needing to uh, understand the company culture, not needing to understand the informal channels, not needing to understand to whom who to, to talk for each uh, decision or, or each part of, of the international uh, process. So it was something very, very important for me. And I think companies that want to go abroad need to understand that having someone who already knows the culture, who already knows that informal channels, who already knows how to do the stuff in headquarters, it's a big asset to go and have on a different country. On the other way, the trust from the local team, if there is a local team or if you build a local team, it's something that needs to be started and need to be done since day one. Uh, you need to understand the pains they have. If they, are they, if they are already there, it's very important for you to understand what are, what are they suffering from? Are they suffering from uh, headquarters uh, political views? Are they suffering from local pains that are not being seen by, by headquarters? Are they suffering for uh, different moments of cultural needs? So th there are a lot of basic stuff that you need to understand from the local team and gaining that trust and 
connecting to that those pains very quickly makes the local team uh, see you as one of their own. Because the most important thing there is if you are moving abroad to a, to, a, to a company that already has an operation there, they will see you as a foreigner. They will see you as an outsider, or even they will see you as a mole from headquarters to see why the stuff is not working. You know, so you need to gain that trust very fast, very quickly. Because if not, probably the first months are going are not going to be um, very successful. You know, so trust for me is like the key point in in every expand expanding uh, history. The second one is language, and, and I brought a quick example here because I'm from Argentina, and, and all the companies that I work for, except Unilever, are mainly LATAM companies. And when you see LATAM, you may think, okay, LATAM, they all speak Spanish. Besides uh, Brazil, they all speak the same language, so it's very easy to move from one country to the other one. And the, the similarities are so little in the in the language. Uh, even though you can speak the same language, the way you say stuff, the way you do marketing, the way you um, build sentences, the way you put your marketing out of the product, it's so, so different. So um, the, the slangs, how you say things, how you want to connect with the local clients or the, with the local community, um, it shows a lot of closeness, a lot of closeness for a brand to go abroad the first thing you need to gain is a trust with your customers. And by the language, you do that. But if you say the words like another country says it, then you are not, you're putting yourself as a local one. You're putting yourself as a foreigner company, as a, as a company from abroad, you know? And you don't, you don't, don't want to do that. So for me, translation and tropicalizations are very different things. There's a quick example there. It's a Mexican example. Uh, that's something that Despegar did for a long time and still does is uh, we sell um, travel packages like vacation packages, uh, hotel plus flight plus car. And we call that in Argentina paquetes, like packages. But here in Mexico, the word packages <laughs> or paquetes is meant to, do, to be for all the industries. So this is a, a, a very quick example of how the words mean something different in different countries, even when you have a, a same language in, the, in those countries. So again, tropicalization is very different from translation. The, the easy way is to just translate whatever you're doing or put the same things if it's in the same language. But there's a key aspect, not only on saying the, but, uh, the things in the correct way, but also empathizing and having closeness to the new country that you're moving to or going to, that you need to be very aware since day one also. Third, uh, you may say cultural fit, it's a uh, basic stuff, you know, like if you're going abroad, why am I gonna think about the working hours or lunch hours or holidays or, or events? You have no idea the importance that it is for each country, uh, the culture on hours, you know? Let me give you a quick example. Here in Mexico, people eat lunch at 3 p.m. And they probably take like an hour and an hour and a half for that. And it's like a, a, a religious concept for them. You know, they would not eat anything before 3 p.m. And 3 p.m. when you have headquarters in different countries, like most south of it, like Argentina, Brazil, or Chile, it's a three hour or two hour difference from your new brand um, localization like Mexico to your headquarter one. So imagine this. Uh, in Argentina, people eat lunch at 1 p.m. So 1 p.m. in Argentina is probably 11 or 10 p.m. in Mexico. So when the day starts in Mexico, people in headquarters are going out to lunch. So they take an hour to lunch, they come back. Mexico's already starting to work. Then once Mexico is going to lunch, Argentina is probably out of the way. So if you need something from headquarters and you're going to lunch, then the actual hours that you're working together from the local team and the regional team, with in many cases you need to be very connected, are probably not more than two or three hours a day. So if from headquarters, you are not seeing that part, and, and, and even small stuff like, I'm gonna put a meeting at 9 p.m., at 9 a.m. Argentina, that's 6 a.m. in Mexico. So you need to understand how that affects people and how that affects the actual day work for the new country that you're moving. And I'm talking LATAM. Imagine if you want to go from LATAM to Asia or to uh, Europe. You have seven, eight hour difference. 
it's very, very hard. And you need to understand how your headquarters, how the, 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 the first country that you're moving from is prepared for that. Not only on, on lunch hours, working hours, the, the, the amount of holidays you have and how holidays are important for the local team versus the regional team. How are gonna things work once the holiday is taken in headquarters? How things are gonna be working once holidays are in the local team? There are a lot of amount of small stuff that you may say, this is something that I'm not gonna be putting any effort once I decide to go abroad, that in the day-to-day -day basis will affect your operation, will affect your, um, your the cultural effect, will affect HR will affect every single thing that you need to have people very confident and very close to the to the objective of of, of finding PMF of, of growing the company you know and of course if you don't say this like in the beginning when you hire people in the local communities in local countries they will expect this to happen like in a normal way they will expect to have meetings from 9 a.m moving forward not 6 a.m so you need to be very careful how headquarters are gonna, or the first country is gonna feel about this stuff. And you need to be very precise on how you're gonna say this to the people that you hire in the new country. It's a small thing, but the cultural fit is something very, very, very important. On the fourth subject, like the everyday living fact is a, another thing that affects uh, the way you think about the business. And, and, and I wanna relate this not to the way people work, on or how they do stuff at work, but more on how you think of your product or your company once you go abroad. Let me give you a quick example. In Argentina, when we were in Despegar, the, we, we rock it with installments. So uh, people in Argentina buy a lot of trouble in free installments. And there was a moment in the time in the country that we had like 18 or 24 month installments uh, with no interest. So people would buy all their trips, all their travels with installments with no interest, something that probably in the US is not very common. In Latin America, it's very, very common. So once the Svegar hit that key in Argentina, they say, let's go and put that same thing in every single country in Latin. And when I arrived, uh, when I arrived to Colombia, the amount of uh, sales that we had with free installments was very low. And I started to ask people in the office if they would buy the, the packages, the flights, the hotels in installments, in the free installments, and everybody would say no. And I was, why? This is like a financial benefit for you. You can like parcel your, your, your trip in like 10 or 12 installments and pay the same stuff of money. And then you will pay like once of a 12 each time. They told me, no, you can't do that because the bank here in Colombia, if you don't pay, if, if, for example, if you don't pay the, like the whole amount of, of your credit card that month, they will start charging interest, installment interest on your account. And that would be like opposite to the offer that Despegar was giving them because Despegar was saying free installments and the bank, because you do not pay like the whole amount of money, would start charging interest, interest on this not those installments. So of course, nobody would buy installments because if you have a different concept of what installments are and the interest the bank will pay us, the offer from the company is not an offer after all. And again, that's a quick, very quick example of something that work in headquarters saying, you know what, let's put it out in every single country and not understanding the first main thing that is how Colombians pay for things, how banks in Colombia define what you pay. So this small stuff, it attacks and it puts your pressure in every single concept of your business, in the payments of, of, uh, of all the products, in the marketing you do. Like for example, if a country is more a radio country than a TV country, so people listen to a radio and, and you wouldn't know that. Of course there are studies and, and, and a lot of stuff, but you wouldn't know that if you don't live there, if you don't ask the people there, hey, where do you get the news from? Do you read a newspaper? Do you watch TV? Do you listen to radio? So there are a lot of everyday living facts that would define your model, that would define your product, that would define your marketing, that you would define every single action you take, even though you prove a model different and, and successful in a different country. So this is something very, very much important 
from day one again, because if not, you're gonna spend so much time not knowing why something that worked somewhere else is not working here. And, and, and in my case, it was payments with trips, you know, and payments with different things, but it has to be very connected to the core business that you guys are, are, are seeing or the company is trying to, to pursue or to, to move abroad, you know? Channels is a, is a is another thing that it's something that probably you don't think about once you move, but you start seeing in, in, in the local communities. And here's a small picture of how people eat here in Mexico, for example. There are thousands of, of pots in the streets. Most of the people, the working people eat in the streets. It doesn't matter if you are a VP, a CEO, a manager, a director, or a simple analyst, everybody sits in the same table in the streets and eats the same food. So all the ways that you need to sell your product or your service in a country are very, very different from the ones that you may thought it would be in the, in the home headquarters. So um, mobile penetration is better an omni-channel versus a multi-channel, the online versus the offline world. Those questions, don't take them from granted. You know, th those are not granted questions that you need to say. So if I my product worked in my first country online, it would definitely work online on my on my next country. This is something that it may be true, but it may be, not be true. So you need to understand that from again a local perspective and from those everyday living facts. How are people gonna uh, connect to your product, connect to your service, connect to your company? And in, in, what are those channels? What are those direct or indirect channels that they will need to see your product and your service to get a, a, a good sense where you, you're coming from. Um, six, I think it's the team motivation. I had a quite a, an experience in Colombia when, when I arrived there because I had a very solid team. I had a very, very, very intelligent people there, but they were not motivated. And, and, and all the motivations, they come from from different angles, you know. Uh, maybe the motivation is because they are not clear on the path. Maybe a motivation is because they do not have a, a good workspace. Maybe mo motivation is the, the basic needs are not being uh, resolved by the the home country. There are a lot of aspects that you may see as a team motivation. I don't know, Aaron. I, I saw a, a hand up. I don't know if you want to ask a question. No, keep keep going. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. <laughs> No worry. And, and so, so you need to have a motivated team because once you move abroad, the team is going to make the difference. The, the team is going to be the actual talent that is going to make it or break it and have them motivated. Even again, with the small things like a good office, a good place to work. I had something in, in Colombia that when I arrived, like everybody was working uh, from different coffees. There was no team unity. So it was something very important. Uh, the last two, and I don't want to spend that much time because I know there's a, a Q and A after that, and, and probably a, more work. Uh, are blind spots? Uh, you need to define and and see clear what is important be, versus what is urgency and what's relevant versus what's nice to have. Mainly in the first six months, it's something that you need to ask yourself every single day. What am I? What am I doing? It's really the thing that I wish I should be doing, or it's something that I want to do, because that question would define if you are attacking the problem right now, or if you're trying to attack future problems that are going to come up, come ahead. Once you go abroad, you're going to have tons of different aspects to look at, tons of different problems to solve, and you need to be very precise on defining which is the important, the urgent problem today versus the one that you're going to have to solve probably in, in the close future. And the last one is um, because going abroad is also a, a project, you know, it's also something that the company is uh, evaluating with results. You need to understand that there are battles that you need to fight with headquarters and there are battles that you, need, you don't need to fight until different moments of time of the maturity of the business. Um, you need to show headquarters or, 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 or you need to show the company that you're getting some small quick wins and then have the opportunity to fight those big battles. Having those quick wins would not, not only uh, be very successful for the PMF path, 
but would also give uh, some type of tranquility or, 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 or good sense to whoever decided to go abroad and say, okay, this team, these guys are, are knowing what they're doing. And from that, we can now start seeing some big other battles to fight, some big other uh, definitions to have. And, and because if you try to fight the big ones at first, it will probably take a long time. And with, with more time, it, it comes uh, impatience, it comes more money to spend, it comes more time to spend. And then because of that, they will probably see or think that they, uh, going abroad is not a, a great solution or, or, or a great way to, to, to go. And I spoke a lot. I think we can stop for now and, and maybe have a, a different questions. I don't know, Aaron, plus how you guys want to do it. Uh, that was that was awesome, Ezekiel. I, I, I have like 10 questions myself, so I'm going to control myself by only maybe starting with one or two, uh, and then we can open it up. So uh, if, if you guys have any questions, you can uh, raise your hand and we can we can bring you in for the audio side, or if you feel more comfortable typing in the Q&A, feel free to do that. Uh, but in the meantime, as, as people are thinking of, of their questions, um, you know, what, what, one thing as a side that you, you were just talking about, about channels and about, you know, different cultural practices. I, I always find it interesting when, when you see parallels between different stories. And, and one of our previous growth stories, we had Troy Malone, who uh, expanded Evernote, and, and he talked about his story in India. And they were talking about the, uh, and he had talked about the Dabawalas, who are these uh, people who carry around these big boards over their head with a bunch of buckets with people's lunches in it. And to your point, you know, whether, whether it was a CEO or, or even a lower level employee, a lot of people worked in that system, like the street stalls you were talking about in Mexico. So it's always, it's always cool to, to hear that. Um, I want to go back to the, the first topic you talked about, because I think it's, it's uh, so important around trust. And, and there are so many different parts to it. Um, and one thing in particular that, that you were highlighting is this, um, the, just, just to bring into one of our frameworks, is this importance of overlap between company knowledge and local knowledge. And, uh, you know, in your case, because you had worked at headquarters for quite a while, you had developed a lot of that company knowledge. But being from Argentina, but, you know, going outside of Argentina, there was local knowledge you didn't have. You know, how did, how did you, and, and, and the other point we make also is that having this overlap is not necessarily just one person who has it, it's collectively amongst the team. So how did you navigate bringing in your company knowledge uh, and, and then also tapping into the local knowledge and, and how trust kind of fits in between that as, as each side is helping each other out? We'd love to get some of your perspective on that. Now, that's, that's a great question because of course, when, when you go abroad from an entrepreneur position, the, the first thing that you have is the local knowledge from headquarters, you know? So in my, ca in my case, it was a, a little bit different. I had a position in Despegar headquarters, which I already knew some of the countries. So I, I did some traveling because I was connected to the countries. So at first that was very good. It was probably one of the main things because once I arrived to Colombia, which was the first country, people already knew me and I already knew some of the people. So to get that local flavor, to get that local trust, I already had built that from a different angle uh, a few years before. So again, that's something that maybe it's a, it's a good thing to, to know and to have. The other thing is once you arrive there, they will always see you, as I mentioned before, like the mold, the, the, peop, the person from headquarters coming to do something to the local team, you know? So you need to gain the trust from being close to the local team and having their backs on some specific matters, some specific pains that they are having or they were having for a long time. Uh, let me give you a quick example. In, in, in Colombia, once I, I got there, um, people were trying to uh, push for a product that wasn't being developed. It was a new airline that was very important for the local market that by any, by some reasons, headquarters was not prioritizing through the whole process, you know? So I saw that, I saw the urge of having that airline, maybe not the, the size of the project was that important, but the urge of the local team to have that for a commercial perspective was very important. So I gained their trust by pushing with them for that project to be more prioritized through the roadmap on that quarter or semester, I don't remember. And having that develop and seeing them 
having their backs with the headquarters was something that gained trust very fast, very quickly. And you could see like the things moving in the correct direction once that that's there, you know? So it's very important to have build that trust before that. And also in the first month to have them, like have them their backs on different strategic projects that they feel are very important. And of course, with your perspective, something that can be done in headquarters, you know? I mean, that's a really important point when you, when you think of, of making it ta uh, tactical is like, take that company knowledge you have and use it as a tool to build that trust. I think that's a really, really great point. Um, Absolutely. So, but, but before seeing what other questions everyone else had, one more thing I wanted to talk to you about, and this is one of my, my favorite things to talk about. I, I think in particular, it's valid, very, very relevant for uh, companies that come from English speaking countries and Spanish speaking countries. And Klaus and I, we label this as what we call a familiarity bias. We often assume, okay, uh, to use a US example, oh, well, let's go to UK and Australia and Canada. They speak English, that's the right countries to go to. And, and I think there's this, you know, to, to, to what you're talking about, okay, all right, let's go from Argentina to Mexico and, and other countries because they speak Spanish or, or countries maybe more closely bordering. Um, would love to get some of your perspective on in any other stories you have around where other markets ended up being more effective, even though they didn't have that familiarity, or maybe other things you struggled with despite the similarity of language. Um, I think LATAM is it's probably a very complex uh, Spanish continent, you know, because you may feel this is the, the, the same approach. You no, know, they all speak Spanish. Why don't you go like? everywhere that, that they speak Spanish. But then you start seeing, and, and the language is probably the first barrier because you may say, okay, if I have my, my website and it's in, in Spanish, all these countries that are not Spanish speaking countries, then I will have to do like a different task because I would need to translate the whole thing. So let's go to the Spanish one. But you may find much more closeness to maybe English speaking countries, even though, and, and, and the effort, it would only be translating the website than from other countries. And let me give you a quick example on, on, on LATAM. You have Argentina as one type of country. Then you have all the, the, the ones like, like they're called Andinos. So like Chile, Peru, maybe Colombia and Ecuador like can be on that group. Mexico is a different thing. And, and Brazil is a different thing. So in that same continent where at first you will say, everybody speaks Spanish besides Brazil. There are different cultures, there are different um, ways of living, there are different ways of perceiving value. Uh, even the, 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 the actual cities are very different. You may have nothing in common between uh, Buenos Aires, Bogota, Santiago de Chile, Lima, and Quito. Uh, you may start with, there are different level of sea, you know, people are have different uh, oxygen in their in their lungs, you know, and, and it's something that it happened to me when I moved, you know, I played soccer in Argentina, I started, I moved to Bogota, it was like 2,000 meters up, I didn't have strength in my, my lungs to, to play soccer. So those things <coughs> affect the everyday life, but not only the everyday life, and it was part of, part of what I said before, it defines how you travel, it defines how you eat, it defines how you, how you buy. So the bias of these are Spanish speaking countries, let's go there, it changes in every single thing. Let, let me give you a quick example. Mexicans are very passionate about their country, very passionate. So all the connections they make once they are abroad is to food. They try to feel close to home by eating similar food that they eat at home. Why is that? Because here in Mexico, you eat a lot of spicy food. And Mexicans feel that every single country of the world with no spicy food, it tastes less food, you know, it's food that doesn't taste. So they connect all their trips, all their holidays, all their, their uh, knowledge of, 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 or the wantings to travel to food. So that's something that if you do not put on the marketing perspective of how to sell more of that product in Mexico, you will never get the grip of the cultural and local flavor of why, why would they love your brand? And, and it's something that this because it happened a lot to us, a lot. So we tried, when I arrived here and I started seeing and feeling that stuff, 
we tried to put that in food. So we started doing uh, campaigns with food connections. So go to Paris and eat this and go to Rome and eat that. And that's something that it's only felt by the local team, by the local people, by knowing here. And it's something very hard to, to make headquarters understand because in this case, headquarters in Argentina, we Argentinians, we love food, but we would never find a place to travel because of the food. And it's something that the, the regional marketing team or the regional commercial team would never like decide to put on to a, a publicity or a marketing spot, you know? And, and that's the main thing there because of course, Mexicans speak Spanish, Argentinians speak Spanish. We all speak the same language, but we define our needs and we define our uh, taste by different things. And if you don't have that local angle, that local perspective, and you feel like because it's all the same language, I would definitely have this product being successful in another, in another language, uh, in a, another country with the same language, that's a big mistake. And it would take a lot of time to fix, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think that there, there are a couple of stories that, that come to mind that, that we'd heard as well. And you know, one of them on, on the language side, we were speaking to someone who used to run uh, language translation for Tableau, the, uh, the uh, B2B software. And when they launched in Germany, they didn't spend as much time to really you know, localize different parts of the German. And they, they got a lot of very blunt responses. And, and one of the people I remember them saying, basically said like, if you can't get the language translation right, how can we expect your product Absolutely. is any good? But, um, but to the other part too, uh, which, which thought was you know, interesting the way you described it is even some of these nuances are different. We heard from Elise Rubin, who's head of uh, product internationalization and launch for Google Nest. The, the concept of fresh air in Korea versus Japan is very different. In Japan, it's opening up the windows and letting the fresh air in. In Korea, because they have a lot of air that comes from uh, industrial parts of China, fresh air is closing the window. Okay. And okay. so, um, yeah, really interesting. So let's, uh, I, I know we only have a few minutes left. Uh, what questions do, uh, do you attendees have? Would love to, to talk about anything you particularly want to hear about. So we'll, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for the Q&A if anybody wants to ask those questions and, uh, or, or raise your hand and we can, um, and we can, uh, promote you to be able to talk. So uh, feel free if you have any questions. Uh, in, in the meantime, while we're waiting for that, sure. um, maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, a, another. Um, so we talked a bit about culture. And uh, one, one thing that, that Klaus and I found in our research is this emergence of, of a, what we call a community culture. So a lot of the culture we're talking about is very national based country by country. But um, what we found is they're, they're because of uh, you know, online platforms and otherwise, there tends to be these niche groups based on a specific uh, area of interest or hobby or otherwise that connect with each other across borders. And, and the story we heard from Jennifer Yuen from um, Airbnb talked about uh, how they often, when they went to new countries, would target marathon runners because they had, uh, th this sort of group was very, very much engaged, they had a very similar vocabulary. So for marketing messages, they could reach them across borders was curious if you found any of that in your experience uh, with with a specific subset of, um, uh, of yes no that's different that's definitely there uh, I think Despegar was a brand that was already known in a different perspective with all these were were in that in that path you know because all this being a, a platform that enables SMBs to get more sales through marketplaces I think it's something that we we are in the look for, you know, those type of niche, the, the marketing niche. There are a lot of influencers that give a, like marketing advice and they give like a marketplace advice through uh, social media. And we're targeting those, those, those people because we find those people to be very engaged to what online selling is and giving them tips and tools. But that, that's definitely a, a way to go. And uh, once you find that niche, once you find that group of people that would carry your brand and carry your message throughout the whole country that's that's probably product market fit in in place you know and um, we find it very very useful to find these type of groups but it's also very hard because when you come with a brand abroad and you come from a different country the explanation and, and the education of that brand it's a it's a hard work you know so you need to be very precise 
the same way that I, I was mentioning about uh, how you say it, because if the, your language is wrong, then definitely your product is going to be wrong. Here's the same thing. If you put your product in a, in a niche that is not the actual correct niche to go to, then you'll definitely have a different aspect of how your brand is going to be perceived in that country from finding the correct niche. So I think it's, it's a very careful move that you need to make. But once you find it, you're definitely going to have a different perspective of the brand in that country and, and the product in that country. Very, very relevant point. Absolutely. So that, that kind of a double-edged sword, goods and bads to that. Um, yeah. So uh, Sara Caballero, she, she had a, a question. Uh, so Sarah had written, I'm interested in how you start the team in other countries. Which area do you start with? And do you recruit from headquarters or do you use local agencies? It's, it's a great question, Sara. And I think it's it, it different depending on the on the moment of the of the expansion. And, and I had different perspectives. When I went to Despegar in Colombia and Mexico, I had already a team in place. So it was much more of seeing if the talent was the correct talent for the correct task. So it was more of analyzing the, the, the team and analyzing the, the people. Uh, in all this, I'm building the team from scratch. So uh, you need to define very, very importantly, which are, which are those areas that will get you to PMF faster. So for example, if you are trying to put a product, an actual physical product in place, you're probably gonna have more focus on a sales team. And if you're having to put a service out, maybe the marketing team is something much more relevant before the sales team. So you need to understand, first of all, in your business, in your company, what is product market fit or, or where to find product market fit. And I will start from that. And the other part is recruitment from headquarters. It's not all, always uh, the best choice because of all the cultural uh, bias that I mentioned before, of all the language bias that I mentioned before, if you have headquarters doing the, the stuff for you in in the local team, you may not find the correct talent. And there's, there's also a big difference between salaries, between benefits, between working hours, holidays, from what headquarters may see as something basic or, or above basic and what you need in, in the local team. My recommendation there would be either if you already know someone from HR or recruiting locally, definitely go for that person. It would speed up the process and it would help you get much more sense of what the local team needs. Or a, a local agency would also be very helpful for the first key positions. And then I would go all locally. I will try to do it all locally because that's the only way to get a real sense if the talent is correct, the person is correct. There's also a lot of different ways to talk. You know, uh, Me Mexican and, and Colombians, for example, are not that direct. So they will not say to you in your face the, the things that you want to hear. By other chance, Argentinians are totally transparent. They will throw it to you. So you need to have that sense when you're recruiting because if not, you will miss a lot of money and a lot of time hiring the, the wrong people at the beginning. So for me, that's, that's probably the, the best way to go. Very, very valid points. I, um, I think the other thing, and, and this is less appropriate when it when you're going from one country that speaks the same language to another. But um, we, we had heard some people we, we interviewed as part of our book talking about how uh, people would often choose the person who had the best language skills. Right. You know, right. Like, you know, who like, like, let's say you're expanding in Germany, the person who speaks the best Spanish, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're the right person to hire totally. There's all these other, totally. other yeah. things. Um, so, that was uh, that was definitely quick. We've kind of we've kind of come come to the end of our time, so we understand if some people got to leave. We we did have one question come in real quick from Bruce Templeton, so I'll I'll read that and then and then we'll wrap things up. But um, he Bruce asked, do sales reps in different countries have different expectations about incentives and compensation? For instance, are there different mixes of commissions to base salary for different countries? Yes, absolutely. The, the, the whole compensation stuff, it's very different in each country. And you can have a sense of the, like, the, using the same structure, but at the end, the expectations, not only on the commission side, but as a whole package salary base, it's very, very different. It's very complex. 
and it's never um, related. Let me give you a quick example, and with this we can close. There are people in different countries with lower level seniority that have higher uh, salary compensation than people in other countries with higher level seniority. So you may say like a manager in a country uh, earns much more than a VP in a different country. So that happens, and that's something, again, when you go abroad, you need to understand, because if not, you're gonna end up hiring uh, less talented people because you are uh, top by the, the salary with you know a band. And that's something that you need to know, not only on the way you build the, the compensation and the benefits, but also the whole package salary that you're going to propose to each country talent people. You know? Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, Ezekiel, thank you. Thank you again. Uh, we really appreciate your time. And uh, on behalf of Klaus and I, uh, you know, th thank you for uh, supporting other entrepreneurs and, and, and supporting the global class community. And, uh, and just a, a quick thing out there, we have our, our book Global Class coming out at the end of August. We're just about to start pre-order orders and we have some cool bonuses to, to share. Um, but uh, Ezekiel, has, th thank you so much for, uh, sure. for your time and, and hope everybody has a great afternoon, morning, night, wherever you happen to be across the world. Uh, and, uh, and thanks again, everybody. Thank you guys and hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much.